Okay, we're going to begin some warm up. This is a court case. We have uh, Mr. Mock for the people and Mr. Rayel for defense. So go ahead and identify. I am the attorney for the plaintiff, Mr. Mock. I'm the witness. <laughs> I'm the court. I am defense attorney, Mr. Rayel. And we are reading in 15th case, so that'll be at 200 words a minute. Okay. It begins with the court for the record. Please be seated. I'll call the matter of People versus John Lee Lacey, defendant is present with counsel, the district attorney. This is the time set for the preliminary hearing. Defendant is charged in count one with a violation of section 288 of the penal code and an allegation of being the defendant more than 10 years older than the alleged victim. Count two is the same charge with the same allegation. <coughs> count three, a violation of section 288 with the allegation as to the age. Count four, a violation of section 288 with an allegation as to age. Count five is a violation of section 1203.2 of the penal code. I indicated to counsel in chambers I had planned to attend a funeral at two and would recess this matter until 2.30. Mr. Rael also has some problem with his scheduling this afternoon. We will meet here at 2.30 and then go as far as we can. And if Mr. Rael can delay his matter until 3.30, why we will proceed at 2.30. The matter of the people versus Lacey. Were you able to gain a half hour or whatever? Yes, my presence is expected as late as 4 o'clock. I think we will be okay. Well, hopefully we can conclude the prelim. Right, I think we will be okay. Would you call your first witness? Are there any motions about excluding witnesses? Yes, I would move to exclude witnesses, Your Honor. All right, the witnesses will be excluded in this case. They should remain in the corridor until they are summoned by the marshal. Who is your first witness? My first witness is... My first witness is Paula Lacey, Your Honor. I would ask that the witness's mother be allowed to remain in the courtroom with them when they are testifying. They are very young. They are very timid and she would not be testifying as a percipient witness to any specific instances as percipient witness to the act itself, but only about some certain statements in relation to that. But I believe that if the mother is not allowed to remain in here, there might be some problems with their testifying. The problem I see with what the district attorney is saying, Your Honor, is that I believe that the district attorney may attempt to prove some other counts in whole or in part based on evidence from another mother alone, in which case whatever she actually saw the events complained of or not, she will be a material witness as to at least one count. That is not true. I don't intend to prove any particular counts by the mother's statements alone. I said in part or alone. Well, we have a case here where the mother is not a recipient witness to the crime. I suggest you call the mother first, and then we'll take up whether or not she should remain. All right. Then the children would have to remain in the hallway, I think. Mr. Mock, if they are going to all remain in the hallway, I think if the mother remains with them out there, then if you were going to call her, we can take them separately. I think she is either going to be in here or out there, and they are going to be out in the hallway with, sitting in the hallway with strangers. I know. I have a double problem here with what to do. We'll try it. All right. Then have your first witness stay in the courtroom. The others should go out with her then. Do you want to step up here into this chair? Paula, would you tell us your name? Paula Marie Lacey. Okay, Paula, how old are you? 11. 11. What is your birthday? March 18. And what grade are you in school? Fifth. Fifth. Get pretty good grades in school? Yeah. Do you, do you know how to read? Yeah. Do you know how to write? Yeah. Can you do arithmetic in school? Uh-huh. Do you know the difference, Paula, between telling the truth and telling a lie? Uh-huh. Okay, what happens when you tell a lie? You usually get punished in some way. Okay, let me just tell you a little, a little short story. Let's say we have a little girl that is a little girl, it doesn't matter what her name is, and she goes to the store, and she has 50 cents, and she buys a loaf of bread, and it costs 40 cents. So she has 10 cents change left over and she takes that 10 cents and she buys some candy and she eats it on the way home. When she gets home, she takes the loaf of bread and she shows it to her mother and her mother says, was there any change? And she says, no. Now, was that little girl telling the truth or was she lying? 
Lying. She was lying? Yes. Are you going to tell us the truth about everything you testify here today, Paula? Yes. I would ask that this witness be qualified to testify. Do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Paula, do you know what would happen if you were to lie in court today? Yeah, it wouldn't hurt me. It would hurt Daddy. The story the district attorney just told you, have you heard that story before? No. No further questions. All right, the witness is competent to testify. Mr. Mock? Thank you. Paula, how long have you lived in Willow Creek? Since October, I think. Since October? Yes. Where do you live before that? In Arcata. In Arcata. How long did you live in Arcata? Since the beginning of the year. I think since school started. Okay. And before you lived in Grants Pass? Yeah. And then before that, you lived in a place called Happy Camp? I think. I don't. I think. All right. We're going to repeat that. Hang on a little bit. Let's go there. Okay. Fifteens again, please. Okay. Begins with the court for the record. <laughs> Please be seated. I'll call the matter of People versus John Lee Lacey. Defendant is present with counsel, the district attorney. This is the time set for the preliminary hearing. Defendant is charged in count one with a violation of section 288 of the penal code and an allegation of being the defendant more than 10 years older than the alleged victim. Count two is the same charge with the same allegation. Count three, a violation of section 288 with the allegation as to the age. Count four, a violation of section 288 with an allegation as, with a violation of section 1203.2 of the penal code. I indicated to counsel in chambers I had planned to attend a funeral at two and would recess this matter until 2.30. Mr. Rael also has some problem with his scheduling this afternoon. We will meet here at 2.30 and then go as far as we can. And if Mr. Rael can delay his matter until 3.30, why we will proceed at 2.30. The matter of the people versus Lacey. Were you able to gain a half hour or whatever? Yes, my presence is expected as late as 4 o'clock. I think we will be okay. Well, hopefully we can conclude the prelim. Right, I think we will be okay. Would you call your first witness? Are there any motions about excluding witnesses? Yes, I would move to exclude witnesses, Your Honor. All right, the witnesses will be excluded in this case. They should remain in the corridor until they are summoned by the marshal. Who is your first witness? My first witness is Paula Lacey, Your Honor. I would ask that the witness's mother be allowed to remain in the courtroom with them when they are testifying. They are very young. They are very timid and she would not be testifying as a percipient witness to any specific instances as a percipient witness to the act itself, but only about some certain statements in relation to that. But I believe that if the mother is not allowed to remain in here, there might be some problems with their testifying. The problem I see with what the district attorney is saying, Your Honor, is that I believe that the district attorney may attempt to prove some other counts in whole or in part based on evidence from the mother alone, in which case, whether she actually saw the events complained of or not, she will be a material witness as to at least one count. That is not true. I don't intend to prove any particular counts by the mother's statements alone. I said in part or alone. Well, we have a case here where the mother is not a percipient witness to the crime. I suggest you call the mother first and then we'll take up whether or not she should remain. All right, then the children would have to remain in the hallway, I think. Mr. Mock, if they are going to all remain in the hallway, I think if the mother remains with them out there, then if you're going to call her, we can take them separately. I think she is either going to be in here or out there, and they are going to be out in the hallway with, sitting in the hallway with strangers. I know, I have a double problem here with what to do. We'll try it. All right. Then have your first witness stay in the courtroom. The others should go out with her then. <coughs> Do you want to step up here into this chair? <coughs> Paula, would you tell us your name? Paula Marie Lacey. Okay, Paula, how old are you? 11. 11. What is your birthday? March 18. And what grade are you in school? Fifth. Fifth. Get pretty good grades in school? Yeah. Do you, do you know how to read? <coughs> yeah. Do you know how to write? Yeah. Can you do arithmetic in school? <coughs> uh-huh. Do you know the difference, Paula, between telling the truth and telling a lie? Uh-huh. Okay, what happens when you tell a lie? <coughs> you usually get punished in some way. Okay, let me just tell you a little, a short story. Let's say we have a little girl that is a little girl, it doesn't matter what her name is, and she goes to the store and she has 50 cents, and she buys a loaf of bread and it costs 40 cents. 
So she has 10 cents change left over and she takes that 10 cents and she buys some candy and she eats it on the way home. When she gets home, she takes the loaf of bread and she shows it to her mother and her mother says, was there any change? And she says, no. Now, was that little girl telling the truth or was she lying? Lying. She was lying? Yes. Are you going to tell us the truth about everything you testify here today, Paula? Yes. I would ask that this witness be qualified to testify. Do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Paula, do you know what would happen if you were to lie in court today? Yeah, it wouldn't hurt me. It would hurt Daddy. The story the district attorney just told you. Have you heard that story before? No. No further questions. All right. The witness is competent to testify. Mr. Mock? Thank you. Paula, how long have you lived in Willow Creek? Since October, I think. Since October? Yes. Where did you live before that? In Arcata. Arcata. How long did you live in Arcata? Since the beginning of the year. I think since school started. Well, there is an act that happened in Oregon. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <coughs> okay, and before that, you lived in Grants Pass? Yeah. And then before that, you lived in a place called Happy Camp? I think, I don't, I think. All right, we're going to do some warm up from our other 200 um, poor boys. We're going to do this at 210. And uh, we have our attorneys are Mr. Stearns for the people and Mr. Land for defense. Let's identify. I am a an attorney for the plaintiff, Mr. Stearns. I'm the witness. I am the court. I am Mr. Land for defense. And let's begin on line 20. Let's start with the witness. So witness for the record. All locks have a series of pins, which is the opening device, and each lock has a number. You take this number, look it up in your code book, and you can tell which slots to cut and what location on the key. And you have a special machine that you can use now yes. to make those keys? Yes. And you say that machine was missing? Yes. And you said you had some master picks? Yes. One of those little things that one would see on television that they would wiggle in the doorknob and they open the door? Right, uh-huh. Anything else, gentlemen? No. No, Your Honor. You may step down. Your Honor, may we take a brief recess? Mr. Wheat tells me he has to. Yes, let's take a 15-minute recess. We will start again at 3.30, according to the clock on the wall in the courtroom. All parties are back in the courtroom, as is the jury. Please proceed. We call Shirley Dalton to the stand. What's she going to testify to? Statements made by the defendant, Your Honor. All of them? Some of them. All right. Raise your right hand to be sworn, please. I do. Be seated, please. Please, please state your full name, please. Shirley Dalton. And where do you live? 889 Vermont Interlock. One day in April, did Mr. Wall come over to your house and have a conversation with you and Mr. Holgate? No, he didn't. I didn't see him. He may have been at Mrs. Mahoney's house. Okay. When you Were you over at Mrs. Mahoney's house when there was a conversation between Mr. Wald and Mr. Holgate? No, I wasn't. Mrs. Mahoney had told me some stuff. She was very upset, and she had called me. Who's Mrs. Mahoney? That's John Holgate's grandmother. Do you know what Mrs. Mahoney's first name is? Dolly. Dolly Mahoney? Yes, uh-huh. Do you recall a conversation with a Detective Tate from the Sherlock Police Department on April the 8th? Yes, I did. And Detective Lundgren was there at the time, wasn't he? Yes. When they came in to search the apartment, I was there, and then he had talked to me. Okay, and they conducted an interview with you? Yes, they asked me if I had, you know, heard anything. When the bail bondsman brought John in, Mr. Holgate, when they had left, I was still there. And I asked John how did he get the keys to the stores, and he had told me that he didn't have nothing to do with getting any keys. He said... I'm going to object to that, Your Honor. It's hearsay. Sustained. Did you hear Mr. Wald make any statement about any property from Beaver's locksmith? No, I did not. Did you hear him make any statement about any Beaver's locksmith burglary? No, I did not. Did you hear him make any statement about a burglary at Lee Brothers Stationery? No, I did not. Did you hear him make any statement about an attempted burglary at Target? No, I did not. Your Honor, I'd ask that Detective Lundgren, Detective Tate, be called in to play the tape of the interview she had with him. It is impeachment by prior inconsistent statement, Your Honor. What's on the tape? What's on the tape? It's a statement where she tells, it's my understanding, it's a statement in which she tells a detective that Wald had admitted being involved in all three of the burglaries. That's probably true if that was told to her by Mrs. Mahoney. Yeah, Mrs. Mahoney. If Mrs. Mahoney told this witness that Wald implicated himself, that's already happened. Can I explain? Just a moment. 
She's already testified that Mrs. Mahoney gave her that information. She never had the conversation with Mr. Wald or anyone else. If you want to call Officer Tate, that's fine. You started to make an explanation. Okay, Mrs. Mahoney had called me. She was upset and she told me- Objection, Your Honor. What Mrs. Mahoney said is objectionable. It's hearsay. Right, I understand that. Besides what Mrs. Mahoney told you, were you ever present at the time that Mr. Wald made any statements concerning the burglary? No, I was not. Did you ever tell Detective Tate that you were present? No, I did not. May I have just a moment? Certainly, let's take a brief recess. Your Honor, may we have about a five minute recess to listen to the tape? We're in recess, back on the record. Defendants are present, the attorneys are present, the witness is present. Proceed, Mr. Stearns. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Land? No questions. You may step down now that you've back, now that you're back up here, you can step down. Your Honor, may this witness be excused? Any objection? No objection. There's no objection, you are excused. People rest. We have people's one marked, that is the tape. That is evident, Your Honor. Any objection to people's one being in evidence? Your Honor, I would object to the admission of the tape into evidence because seeing this in the whole, I haven't seen any evidence to tie my client into the Lee burglary. There's some evidence in there on that. All right, over your objection, people's one will be in evidence, but the record hasn't got my comments as to any references to thorn or wheat that were stricken. People rest? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Land? No evidence, I just have a couple of comments to make. Motion to make them, Your Honor. Any evidence? No, Your Honor. Care to argue? Waive opening arguments. Mr. Land? Yes, Your Honor. My client is charged with an attempted burglary. In order for there to be an attempted burglary, there has to be a corpus established of a burglary. There has been no testimony at all of any lack of permission, and without that, I submit that we do not have a corpus for burglary, and therefore, we do not have an attempted burglary. Secondly, the only evidence we have of the door being tampered with is the testimony of the officer who observed the door and said that the paint transfer on a crowbar found in another person's possession appeared to be the same color as that which was found on the door, which I guess one can say that was caused by the crowbar in Mr. Wald's possession. However, there is no evidence as to when that was done. It could very well be that Mr. Wald was returning for a second trip, and the first time when the attempt was made, Mr. Thorne was nowhere around. That's just an example of some of the possibilities, and it's only utilized to show what deep gaps and holes there are in the prosecution's case. So that's the second basis I make for finding that my client should not be held to answer on attempted burglary. The third thing that I'd like to point out is that there was evidence that the other two individuals with my client had both items that allegedly were stolen from other places, and these burglaries occurred at the same period of time as this target burglary or attempted burglary or lack of corpus burglary. The fact that my client had absolutely nothing on him, I think, is an inference that he was not with these other individuals earlier. And if that inference is made, I think the other inference can be made that if that door had, in fact, been attempted to be opened, my client was not there at that time. It was my client who was not taking any evasive action when the police officer arrived. It was my client only that has on him a flashlight. Now, one can say, what is he doing with these other two people? And I agree with you, Your Honor. But I would ask that he not be held to answer because although the court may be somewhat suspicious, it would have to speculate. There are so many possibilities as to why Mr. Thorne was there that I think you can't say there's a strong suspicion that he's involved in a burglary. Mr. Stearns. With respect to Mr. Thorne, Your Honor, the evidence discloses that found on him was a flashlight and some gloves that he was wearing. He was wearing tennis shoes. He had a knife. He was with a person who had a crowbar. It was late at night. The people he was with attempted to hide. I don't know if it was because he didn't see the police. It's obvious he didn't attempt to hide. It's nighttime. It's a place where the officer knew from a prior experience that he had a prior burglary. The officer had probable cause to detain them on 466 of the penal code, possession of burglary tools. Subsequent investigation shows that that was confirmed. When he found the crowbar on Mr. Wald, the other items found were probable cause to arrest. Mr. Land, any comment that you'd care to make? Pardon me? Anything else you'd care to say? No. Submit it? Yes. All right. As far as the 1538.5 motion, in regard to the detention, I think it was a valid detention in this case, and there was nothing wrong with that detention. The officer certainly had reasonable cause to do what he did, considering the early morning hours, the three people walking in an area of a used car lot close to the Target store with gloves on, two of them ducking down. The week before, there had been a $10,000 burglary at a clothing store in the vicinity. 
I think it was good police work to stop them, at least, and find out what was going on. And the subsequent patting down, I think, is not unlawful. All things considered, bail is set at $25,000. Defendant Wald is ordered to appear in the Superior Court of the State of California in and for the County of Stanislaw at Modesto on June 22nd at 8.30 a.m. Any objection to the tape of People's Number 1 be returned back to the Turlock Police Department for their custody and control? No objection, Your Honor. That's what will happen with People's Number 1. As to Mr. Thorne and Mr. Wheat, what time did you want to set it for pre-trial? What days do you have pre-trials, Judge? Monday mornings. I'll tell you what. Are you aware of any problems of Mr. Wheat getting up to Modesto for pre-trial? We can set it on the pre-trial calendar in Modesto if you like. Fine. No problem. Pick a day and we'll put them both on the same day. Pick maybe a Thursday afternoon. That's good. I'm just looking to see where I have a lot of pre-trials. How about just one? Okay. Is that a lot? 25th of June. How about the 18th? Is that too soon for pre-trials? I think it would be, Your Honor. It might be for the DA's office. How about July 2nd? That's fine. July 2, Mr. Wheat and Mr. Thorne. July 2nd at 1.30 in Department B, as in Boy, for a pre-trial conference. Mr. Wheat, you're on bail. You'll remain free on bail as previously posted. No. Mr. Mr. Thorne, you're on bail. You'll remain free on bail as previously posted. Your Honor, the people would request that. Do I understand the court correctly that the bail on Mr. Wald is only $25,000 for all the charges? Judge Cantwell lowered it to $25,000. The people request that the bail be increased, Your Honor. I'll just leave it at $25,000.